everyone, good evening. Welcome to the Western States Legal Foundation's Half-Life event, celebrating 30 years of peace and nuclear disarmament. My name is Rose Aguilar. My name is Rose Aguilar and I host Your Call. It's a daily call-in radio show on KALW 91.7 FM. Today from 10 to 11, we focus on politics and social issues, the environment and the arts, and this very important issue that deserves far more media attention. So tonight we are celebrating the important work of the Western States Legal Foundation. The organization was founded in 1982, think about that, 1982, to monitor and analyze U.S. weapons programs. Their ultimate goal is to abolish nuclear weapons. We're not talking about containing them, we're talking about abolishing them. Now think about this also. These are really important facts that we don't often hear enough. In the 1980s, there were 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Today, 20,000. Now that is progress, but think about the power of these weapons. They have the power to kill us all a million times over. Or put another way, they have the combined firepower of over 130,000 Hiroshima's. 130,000. 95% of these bombs belong to the United States and Russia. 95%. Now here's another fact we don't hear about much today. The U.S. is spending more on nuclear warheads than ever. More today than during the Cold War. More today than during the Cold War. The Obama administration has approved a plan to spend $185 billion by 2020 to modernize the nuclear weapons system. $185 billion. And yet, for so much of the public, nuclear weapons really seems to be a non-issue, and also in the media. So, later in the evening, we are going to have a very important discussion to take a look and talk about what will it take to really reignite this issue and also to reframe the debate, because that's really important, to reframe the debate. In a piece called Rhetoric Versus Reality, Jackie Cavasso, the executive director of WSLF, writes, quote, to legitimize nuclear deterrence as a step towards abolishing nuclear weapons, our task is to change the discourse from the bottom up. When it comes right down to it, this, I believe, is the only thing we can do. Changing the discourse will require the courage not only to speak truth to power, but also to speak truth to each other." End quote. As a consequence of her first arrest and trial for protesting nuclear weapons development, at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab back in 1984, Jackie Cabasso became executive director of the Western States Legal Foundation. In addition to organizing, speaking, and writing, she still designs the t-shirts and the flyers. And Jackie has been working for nuclear disarmament, peace, and environmental sustainability at the local, national, and international levels for more than 30 years. In 1995, she was a founding mother of the Abolition 2000 Global Network to eliminate nuclear weapons. She currently serves on the steering committee of United for Peace and Justice and as North American coordinator of Mayors for Peace. And I just want to quote this article from the Sacramento Bee, written on September 20th, 2002. It was about the 50th anniversary at Lawrence Livermore. And it says, this is about Jackie. Wearing a black t-shirt that mocked the NIF as representing nuclear insanity forever. And NIF is the National Ignition Facility. This is a massive assemblage of lasers that will be used to simulate nuclear bomb detonations. It says, Jackie stood out in a sea of more conservatively dressed visitors, a strategy meant to attract media attention. Quote, I think it's demented. I think it's deranged to be celebrating 50 years of weapons development, she said. It's hard for me to be here. I'm getting through the day pretending I'm a UN weapons inspector. <laughs> Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Jackie Cabasso.
Thank you so much to each and every one of you, to all of our hosts, and to all of our volunteers. And I'll be coming out later to talk more about our extraordinary board of directors. But right now, I want to start out with a confession. We're known for telling the truth, but this actually isn't our 30th anniversary. <laughs> We're actually nearing the end of our 30th anniversary year, and we'll be celebrating our 31st anniversary on March 4th. <laughs> So we chose the name of this event, Half-Life, for the obvious reference to radioactivity, but also because we realized that I will have been doing this for half of my life, as well as my colleague Andy Lichterman. I celebrated my 60th birthday in September. And in the Japanese tradition, the 60th birthday, or Kanreki, actually marks the rebirth and the beginning of your second childhood. So that's what I'm doing now. This is the beginning of my second childhood. And we did have some fun with the name. So here are two different <coughs> readings we received from colleague organizations. Dear Jackie, congratulations to you and Western States Legal Foundation on 30 years of creative, inspiring, and tireless advocacy for peace and global abolition of nuclear weapons. Your truth-telling has shined a bright light of sanity on a world where officialdom is far too often, often mired in their rationality of militarism and nuclear threats. Thank you for all you do at Western States Legal Foundation. We wish you many more half-lives of speaking truth to power, exposing official misrepresentations, and working for a more decent future for humanity. David Kruger, President of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation in Santa Barbara, California. On the other hand, here's another response. Hi, Jackie. Just wanted to wish you well on your half-life event. Sounds interesting and should be a good time. Taking the half-life metaphor forward, I guess this means we have 15 more years of doing this work. <laughs> I dearly hope to be gone long before then. <laughs> have fun, Bob Zuber, Global Action to Prevent War in New York. So that second one kind of reflects the darker side of our attitude at Western States. We do appreciate black humor, it's how we get through our work. And it reminds me that one of the things that we've done over the years is from time to time, when we have a special guest coming into town, we organize a lunch at a local restaurant, and we call it the End of the World Affairs Council. And we always invite the World Affairs Council to come, but they never have so far. So, though I'm better known for my nuclear weapons abolition advocacy, I got my start working against nuclear power. In 1976, I went door to door collecting signatures on the Nuclear Safeguards Ballot Initiative, which passed, prohibiting the construction of any new nuclear power plants in California until a permanent solution can be found to the problem of safe disposition of highly radi radioactive spent nuclear fuel. That problem is no closer now to being solved than it was in 1976, and fortunately the law is still in the books. Now in the aftermath of the continuing nuclear disaster at Fukushima, it's time to shut down and decommission California's aging, leaking Diablo Canyon and San Onofre nuclear <laughs> and replace them with clean, renewable, decentralized, non-nuclear, non-fossil sources of energy. Western States Legal Foundation got its start in 1982, providing legal representation for nonviolent activists arrested protesting construction of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. I was arrested there myself a number of times, and let me explain our name, which I'm often asked about. Western States was formed to counter the right-wing Pacific Legal Foundation, which was asserting that the nonviolent protesters had injured PG&E workers and was trying to force the arrestees to pay for law enforcement costs. We won. In the early 1980s, Western States, as part of the anti-nuclear movement in California, shifted its focus from Diablo Canyon to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and from nuclear power to nuclear weapons. Over the years, Western States has increasingly sought to link nuclear disarmament with global and domestic issues of peace, justice, and sustainability. With Fukushima, we've come full circle. In May of 2011, two months after the beginning of the ongoing Fukushima nightmare, I was at the United Nations in New York with a small group of Japanese atomic bomb survivors. One of them commented, in 1945, 
the United States dropped atomic bombs on Japan. Now we've done it to ourselves. There's nothing good about nuclear power. And having settled that question, let me return to our story. I have a lot of notes going through the years, which I'm not going to take the time to read, but I want to point out to you that in your program, there's an eight-page chronology of some of our activities and accomplishments from 1982 to the present, and I would invite you to take a look at that because there's no way I can go through that now. So let me turn to the current moment a little bit. When the Cold War ended, suddenly, abruptly, a complete surprise to everyone, including the CIA, <laughs> everyone around the planet collectively breathed a huge sigh of relief. I think believing that we had escaped the nuclear holocaust and they could forget about nuclear weapons, because obviously why would nuclear weapons continue to exist if there was no Cold War and no Soviet Union? And they went on to other things. Unfortunately, the threats posed by nuclear weapons have not gone away. And for those of us who were monitoring our local nuclear weapons facilities, in our case, the Livermore Lab, along with our colleagues, tri Valley Cares, who are here, and some others, we saw that the laboratory and the nuclear weapons enterprise very quickly reestablished new justifications for continuing with the nuclear weapons enterprise, and the juggernaut rolled on. Two of the main issues gripping public attention today are prevention of gun violence and avoiding going over the so-called fiscal cliff. Yet, as I speak here today, the United States and Russia, and now India and Pakistan, are pointing the biggest guns imaginable at each other with their fingers on the trigger. I'm talking, of course, about nuclear weapons. If one of those triggers was pulled, it could result in the deaths of tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions or even tens of millions of people and animals and other living things. In January, the Bulletin, the, the bulletin of the Atomic Scientists announced that it's keeping the hands of its doomsday clock at five minutes to midnight. As Lawrence Krauss, co-chair of the Bulletin's board of sponsors explained, the world didn't end last month with the Mayan apocalypse, but we still need to think about how close total annihilation caused by nuclear weapons could be. For many, nuclear weapons have, falling off, have fallen off the political radar entirely, except for the ongoing worry about terrorists or rogue states gaining access to nuclear materials and delivery systems. But the fact remains that the governments of the world already possess perhaps 20,000 nuclear weapons, enough to destroy the world several times over, and we've seen little progress in the quest to rein in this danger. Regrettably, despite his promising rhetoric in 2009, in 2010, President Obama submitted a plan to Congress projecting investments of well over $185 billion by 2020 to maintain and modernize U.S. nuclear weapon systems, including construction of new nuclear warhead production facilities and an array of new delivery systems, and subsequent annual budgets have provided funding at this level. On the same day, the President signed legislation averting the fiscal cliff for now, he also signed the National Defense Authorization Act, authorizing funding for a new nuclear weapons production facility at the Los Alamos lab in New Mexico, which the law requires to become fully operational by 2026. And just a few weeks ago, the Air Force launched a study on modernizing or replacing its current fleet of Minuteman III nuclear missiles, currently housed in underground silos in Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming. The study brings back the concept canceled in the 1980s, of mobile-based missiles, this time based on massive road vehicles, not rails, as well as a new hypersonic aircraft to deliver nuclear warheads. Now, I know some of you remember the MX struggle in the 70s. Sometimes it seems like every victory we think we ever won is only temporary. There are reports that the Obama administration is considering further modest reductions in the nuclear stockpile, but no fundamental change to nuclear force structures or missions is in the cards. In fact, there are disturbing signs that a new Cold War-type arms race is emerging. This time it will be qualitative rather than quantitative, involving fewer but newer nuclear weapons, still in sufficient quantities to end civilization in short order. We at Western States Legal Foundation believe that at a time of twin global economic and environmental crises and growing competition over natural resources, 
the dangers of conflicts among nuclear armed states are increasing. There is good reason to believe that the potential escalation of conflict among nuclear armed states leading to nuclear war is much more likely than the potential use by a state of nuclear weapons which do not yet exist, or by subnational terror terrorist groups that do not yet have them. Yet this very real threat is largely dismissed. We can't await, afford to wait decades more for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Seriously moving toward abolition of nuclear weapons will require taking on other challenges as well, but this is not a reason to delay any longer delegitimizing deterrence and eliminating the role of nuclear weapons in national security policies. There is some good news. There are emerging signs of hope that the world is again turning its attention to the potential consequences of another nuclear weapons use. In November 2011, the International Committee of the Red Cross adopted a strong resolution emphasizing, quote, the incalculable human suffering that can be expected to result from any use of nuclear weapons and the lack of any adequate humanitarian response capacity and the absolute imperative to prevent such use, declaring that it is difficult to envision how any use of nuclear weapons could be compatible with the rules of international humanitarian law governing the conduct of warfare and appealing to all states, quote, to pursue in good faith and conclude with urgency and determination negotiations to prohibit the use of and completely eliminate nuclear weapons through a legally binding international agreement. In April 2012, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War and its U.S. affiliate, Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, released a major new report which concluded that a nuclear war anywhere in the world using as few as 100 weapons would disrupt the global climate and agricultural production so severely that the lives of more than a billion people would face starvation as a result. Today, the world's combined stockpile of nuclear warheads remains at a very high level, more than 17,000. Of these, some 4,300 warheads are considered operational, of which about 1,800 U.S. and Russian warheads are on high alert ready for use on short notice. In response, there have been several recent positive developments at the United Nations. In October 2012, the General Assembly voted on a resolution to establish, quote, an open-ended working group to develop proposals to take forward multilateral nuclear disarmament negotiations for the achievement and maintenance of a world without nuclear weapons, end quote. In a demonstration of their growing isolation from world opinion, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, and Russia cast the only negative votes and additionally declared themselves, quote, unable to accept the working group or, quote, any outcome it may produce. In another important development in the General Assembly, 35 nations signed on to a joint statement on the humanitarian dimensions of nuclear disarmament. The lead point concerns nuclear explosions, immense humanitarian consequences, as well as the inability to provide emergency relief. Those matters will be the subject of a conference to be held in Oslo by the Norwegian government in March. At the municipal level, Mayors for Peace, founded by the A-bomb cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1982, the same year Western States was founded, has grown to include 5,524 cities in 156 countries and regions. There are 209 member cities in the United States, including 13 in Puerto Rico. I'm very happy to say that Oakland is one of them. And Oakland Mayor Jean Kwan chairs the International Affairs Committee of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, where Mayors for Peace is discussed. <laughs> At its most recent annual meeting, the U.S. Conference of Mayors adopted a strong Mayors for Peace resolution calling for U.S. leadership in global elimination of nuclear weapons and redirection of nuclear weapons spending to meet the urgent needs of cities. In the resolution, Quote, the U.S. Conference of Mayors reaffirms its call on the President of the United States to work with the leaders of the other nuclear armed states to implement the United Nations Secretary General's five-point proposal for nuclear disarmament forthwith so that a nuclear weapons convention or a comparable framework of mutually reinforcing legal instruments can be agreed upon and implemented by 2020 as urged by Mayors for Peace and calls on Congress to terminate funding for modernization of nuclear warheads, delivery systems, and production facilities, to slash spending on nuclear weapons well below Cold War levels, and to redirect those funds to meet the urgent needs of cities. And 
doesn't get any more mainstream than the U.S. Conference of Mayors, but I bet you haven't heard that anywhere. We can't afford for the government to take action, though. We can't afford to wait. And we can't afford to treat nuclear weapons as a single issue. To delegitimize nuclear deterrence as a step towards abolishing nuclear weapons, our task, as Rose quoted me saying, but I'm going to say it again, is to change the discourse from the bottom up. When it comes right down to it, this, I believe, is the only thing that we can do. We need to move from the irrational, fear-based ideology of deterrence to the rational fear of an eventual nuclear weapons use, use, whether by accident or design, by some nuclear weapon possessing state that places the threatened use of nuclear weapons at the core of its national security policy. We also need to stimulate a rational hope that security can be redefined in humanitarian and ecologically sustainable terms that will lead to the elimination of nuclear weapons and dramatic demilitarization, freeing up tremendous resources desperately needed to address universal human needs.